National media continues to exaggerate and promote misleading negative headlines designed to diminish the rule of law and those whose job it is to enforce it. Remember, the only people who want to defund the police and dismantle these agencies are the criminals. And don't forget to thank a cop. Now, let's start the show. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to Law Matters. On the show today, we have Sheriff Lamb, and we know he has to leave to go to an event, so we're going to give him the floor for a while. We're going to be talking about gun laws. We want to know, here's the question, does the right to bear arms extend outside of the home, or is it only when called upon by a well-regulated militia? Oh, absolutely extends beyond that. I think that that is a uh, one group trying to uh, to cater the Second Amendment to what they want it to be, which is only about in a militia. I think it's it's very clear that it shall not be infringed, which means infringement means you don't it doesn't put parameters on it. It's not inside the home. We have the ability to protect ourselves. Look, the majority of people who need to protect themselves with a gun does happens outside the home anyway. And so I think it absolutely extends outside the home. I always thought it meant that if somebody broke into your house, you had a right to defend yourself. Well, initially, I thought uh, the right to bear arms meant we could go sleeveless. But after I learned that it was talking about guns... So, you know, Look, I, the founding fathers, you have to understand what their thought process was when they established the Second Amendment. OK, well, they had just it? got through. I wasn't there. You were there. Oh, I wasn't there either. <laughs> I'm not that old. <laughs> uh, when they just got through fighting with England, I mean, and they understood the importance of the reason they were able to beat England was because everybody across the countryside had firearms. And when they were establishing the country, um, it wasn't just for them to protect themselves. It was also to protect themselves against another tyrannical government, which is what we had just got through. We just sent a declaration of independence off to England, told them where we're done with it all. And then we had to go fight them. And then we built this constitution to say, let's not go through that again. And and the con- the whole premise of America is consent to the governed. And the whole idea is for people to have as little government regulation as possible. I'm, look, I'm a rule of law guy, but you also, government has become far too intrusive as well. It's far be extended what the founding fathers originally intended. I mean, we're, we're, we're in many ways, we've got a lot of these things that are going on that are worse than what it was when we wrote the Declaration of Independence the first time. Um, and so now we're kind of, this is what the founding fathers wrote all this stuff for. So the Second Amendment was absolutely established, not for us just to protect ourselves, but to make sure that that didn't happen to us again. So you're you're all for it. Our other guest in the studio is Mike Jetty, and he's a prosecutor. Tell us your thoughts on this. Well, I'm going to do. Thanks, Sherry. I'm going to do a lawyer thing. Those are two different type of questions. So, does the right to bear arms extend beyond the house? Absolutely. No infringement on you can carry your gun outside the house. No infringement. The whole militia debate about how the drafting of the of, of the amendment happened and then the Supreme Court's decision. I'm going to leave that for smarter people. That is a that is a is now ruled upon by the Supreme Court and if someone wants to challenge that, they take a case and they go through the system and they present it to the justices. But right now that, our other speakers right, there's no infringement on the right to bear arms outside the home. I'm not here advocating the otherwise. I mean, you have a right to bear arms outside the home. Okay, we have Hal Comfer on the phone. Hal uh, Sherry, you know, I think the framers, when they were looking at this originally, um, they, they obviously they didn't anticipate the level of weapons that we have today. You know, certain weapons like machine guns, certainly artillery, mortars, um, uh, those are things that are regulated. Uh, there are some out there who said that the Second Amendment covers nuclear weapons. There's a lot of people I know that I would not want to have them running around with a nuclear weapon. Um, uh, but... Yes, it does go outside the home, uh, although uh, the government does have a right to, uh, you know, for public safety purposes to, to do some sort of control of who has those weapons. You know, if somebody is a, a terrorist or a criminal or mentally unstable, obviously in those cases uh, there should be some sort of restriction for public safety purposes. Well, I know that you can be on the do not fly list and go out and buy a gun. Does that make sense, Mark? 
Well, who controls the do not fly list? The TSA or the airlines or I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know who controls that list. Do you know I how? Hope I'm not, I don't think I'm on it because they let me fly and I got to fly tomorrow. <laughs> so hopefully I'm not on it. We didn't make the phone call. <laughs> somebody, somebody missed out. Look, so. it, it, you know, the Second Amendment um, on a national level, obviously it's one way. Um, every state has a different versions of it. And I always say this is why I think that the, your local elected officials are very important who you elected your elected your that they understand, you know, what the second amendment means because and I agree, look, I don't and, and I don't think it extended to nuclear weapons. I don't think that's what um but it certainly re- extends to our ability to to uh, protect ourselves, to have to to bear arms. Um, and I think the federal government, you know, the ATF recently has tried to pass different administrative rules, like saying that they, um, you know, you had the bump stocks and then, but you had the um, re- more recently the wrist braces um, mm-hmm. that they passed. Which I, the problem I have with that is, first of all, I think it's a violation of the Second Amendment. Number two, I think it, it they don't have legislative authority, and I think that's the problem with the government now is we've got the executive, the legislative, and the judicial branch. You've got the executive passing exec, you know executive orders and different things then you've got the judicial branch making case law um, with rulings and then you've got Congress because of politics is just polarized and not getting anything done and so I think that I don't know where I'm going with it I went off on a tangent but I <laughs> I think that we we have to make sure that we're maintaining the the, the rules of government um, and you've got oh the ATF they've they administratively they've passed rules that I think they're way be out beyond their outside of their bounds to do and that what they're doing is taking innocent citizens who bought a gun with a bump with a wrist brace that was legal and now you just said well it's illegal now which basically could potentially make felons out of a lot of legal law-abiding citizens how can they do that though how can they do that's that that's what i asked them too thing? That's what I said. You're not you're not elected officials. You're not part of Congress. You don't establish laws, um, and they think they have the administrative uh, authority to do it, which I disagree with. And I think that that's why it's important, honestly, that we have good elected officials that understand it and let the people vote. and And the people should be the elected officials we send back should be the ones that are establishing the laws as it relates to our our citizenry. True. Okay. Judge Scalise said that uh, he felt that the Second Amendment might protect ordinary handguns, but not bazookas. Do we even have bazookas anymore? I don't know anybody. <laughs> I know a lot of guys who have really nice gun collections. And I don't know anybody who has a bazooka. <laughs> a bazooka? Well, I think he was referring to, you know, automatic, like AR-15s. Is that what they're called? AK forty sevens or whatever. They're I called. hear a lot of talk about automatic weapons, and frankly, they're very expensive. Very few people have them. Um, you can they're, what they're talking about now is people altering, putting in um, devices that make the trigger. Um, like you can put Turn a Glock into switch one? or whatever, and it turns it into it. Listen, I you could do a lot more damage with a with a. Um, uh, if you have a fully automatic gun, I promise you, you're going to do less damage. If You'll go through a magazine in a hot minute. I mean, take a sec, five, ten seconds, not even that, three or four seconds, you'll go through a full magazine of, of, of bullets. You could do a lot more damage with a pump shotgun or you could do a lot more damage with a semi-automatic rifle because every shot you're going to take is, is calculated, much more calculated. And so um, I, I'm not saying that you shouldn't i don't think you should alter these guns but um there's a big push amongst the politicians to to scare everybody like everybody's got these glocks which we don't we hardly ever come across that i didn't know that i thought you, i thought they were just out there randomly on the street anybody could get them i don't remember the last time we've had a case where we've had to charge somebody for that or where we've had somebody that's been using it in a crime okay i feel yeah. safer now <laughs> <laughs> that sounds about right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I may I may know a thing or two about automatic weapons, and uh, uh, you know, yeah, they do go through ammo like crazy. Uh, you can do a lot of damage if you know what you're doing with automatic weapons. Um, you know, uh, machine guns or something. That was kind of my trade, uh, if you want to put it that way, for a while. So I understand the the purpose there, but you know, one of the big problems today is uh, you know it doesn't take much to put an automatic sear into a weapon. To uh, make, you know, take a semi-automatic and make it fully automatic, 
and uh, and that's really <clears throat> one of the big problems. And then, of course, with you know, with three D weapons, where you you know, where you can actually use computer, you know, basically manufacture a weapon mm-hmm. uh, and that's not registered. That's a huge problem. And of course, those weapons they don't exist on any registry. There's there's no way to you know, literally you can't control the sale of those weapons because they're literally making them. Uh, online and so it gets really into the issue of and this probably gets more into into uh mark's area which is uh you know the enforcement side you know if you come across people with those weapons or you have reasonable suspicion they have those weapons you know what do you do mike you're you're a prosecutor what do you do if you have a case where somebody has these weapons how do you prosecute it well when lucky for us it's not a common thing yet but so so I mean, I just want to go back to there's a there's a um, the Chevron deference, which is a Supreme Court decision that gives agencies like the ATF, EPA, OSHA authority to make rules because Congress is aren't Congress and members of Congress are not experts in certain fields, and so they give give agencies administrative authority to to pass regulations, which allows them to regulate in these fields because it takes an expertise. It takes people like Mark and people who understand some of the nuances here. So the ATF can pass regulations that limit and set standards and prohibit we've got ourselves i have no problem with and i have no problem with people having weapons i have no problem with people having weapons outside the home no issues with that however the state does have a place in this in this discussion because we've got domestic violence issues we've got people who are prohibited possessors we have criminals who get weapons on the black market so there there is definitely an area here where the state has authority to come in and regulate now you're mentioning 3d capabilities to create a weapon on your own so Lucky for us, I don't think it's a common thing. Mark, can, if, I haven't seen one, and no. I prosecuted gun cases, and so it's not a common thing yet. I'm not saying it won't be soon, and so this is where you have law enforcement have to get together with prosecutors and other people and figure out what is the best way forward on some of this new technology that's coming forward. But lucky for us, not a big thing. But your Scalia thing, I think Scalia was referring to that it's not an unabridged unabridged right to have any weapon you want. And so there is some place for the state to come in and regulate. And that is what Scalia is saying. You can have a weapon, but the state can say, you know, if you're a prohibited possessor, you you just came out of prison for a homicide, you're not getting your weapon back. And so, or if you if there's a red flag law, you there's a, a red flag issue about you committing a DV, we're going to take that weapon from you until we have a determination that you're not going to harm your spouse or significant other in this situation. So there is a place for the state to come in. And it's a, it's a very, it's a, it's like having a waltz, having a two step dance with somebody. I mean, we have the unabridged right to have a weapon and we have the state, the state has a right to come in and regulate. So we have this dance going on and we're trying to figure out where it is. And lucky for us, we don't have a lot of gray area issues. And so a lot of people use these extreme examples on both sides to defend their argument. But most of our rubbing and problems happen in this very minute area. Would you agree? Yes. Yeah. And and a lot of the gun laws that are NFA. So NFA or items are going to be like machine guns or short barreled mm-hmm. rifles or things that the federal government has said you can't own unless you have a tax stamp. So you have to pay a tax stamp and then you have to go through a process and the federal government, the ATF will approve that. That goes for suppressors as well, which I think is ridiculous. I think suppressors is, it should be a, a legal thing because I think it's like in Europe, it's a, it's, um, it's considered bad etiquette to use a rifle without, uh, some type of noise suppressor on the end of it. But, uh, there, so many of these things are what's called NFA items and those are federal things. So the feds would get involved in charging a lot of those and then we get involved in the prohibited possessor, a domestic situation where somebody has a gun that shouldn't have had it involved. Um, so we have our set of rules and laws that we can charge for, for somebody who has, who has used a gun inappropriately or has a gun inappropriately or there's the federal piece of it, which we don't enforce. Uh, we would have to pass it to the feds, the ATF, or the FBI, or somebody along there. Typically, the ATF, it's a, if it's an NFA item. So if somebody has a domestic violence uh, call, does it just take a phone call? Or do they have to be convicted of something like that? I'm thinking of a sheriff who had a domestic violence call. Would they take his guns away? So 
commonly what it is is the judge will issue let's say there's a uh, uh, a protection an a, a order of protection or an order an injunction of harassment typically right. to on a domestic th- situation it's going to be a, a order of protection Uh, The judge will usually indicate in there that they cannot have firearms while they are on the order of protection. Or if they're convicted of a domestic, the judge may put on there, if it's a felony, obviously you can't have the gun. But if if it's a uh, misdemeanor, the judge may determine that they they can't have guns as well for that period of time. So it kind of depends on what the judge has ruled. Now, you might have a law enforcement guy who gets charged for domestic, and then they put an order of protection on. The judge may... But the judge understands he still has a job in law enforcement. I know it sounds crazy, but (laughs) until he's adjudicated, he still has the ability to go do his job. So the judge may not put that restriction on him or at least give him the ability to carry the gun while he's at work. So a lot of it just depends on what the judge determines he's going to do with it. But yes, domestic situations often have um, some type of, hey, you can't have a firearm while you're under this order of protection or while you're going through this case. Okay, we have a caller. Charles, what's on your mind? I was just going to tell you that uh, Sheriff Lamb is completely correct about the NFA, but that stands for National Firearm Act. It's passed in 1934, and it regulated machine guns, short barrel rifles, uh, Mm -hmm. suppressors, silencers, and they're not illegal to have. There are many... there are about 200,000 privately held machine guns in the United States, which are perfectly lawful to own. The problem with people converting things lately is there's a thing they call the Glock switch, and it's a device you can install on the back of a Glock. And frankly, there's several sort of semi-automatic uh, handguns that you could do it to that I'm not going to detail here on the radio. But the point is that um, <clears throat> they're not legal to convert. And if you get caught with one of those, it's up to 10 years in prison. And if we, the problem is we're not prosecuting. Where you're finding this, the, part of the problem is that they're making these things in China, and people are mail ordering them. Yeah. And yeah. the government can't yeah. keep up with it. And so when they find out, when ATF finds out that someone has ordered one, they go, they go after them. But you, it's simply that the, the genie is out of the bottle on that. And if they were prosecuting people who were doing things that were major felonies like that, um, it would stop. But they're not prosecuting them, and that's part of the problem. Yeah, we do have a problem with people not getting prosecuted. I want to talk to you about the red flag rule, law. Is it a rule? Is it a law? What is it? So it depends on how, I mean, what the basic premise behind a red flag law is if somebody's deemed to have some mental health issues that they would not get a gun, you know, they can't have a gun at that point. The problem is, is that the way the most law red flag laws are written, it allows for my, your, a spouse to call and go, my husband's crazy. And maybe they're just trying to go to get after him. And, and a lot of times there's no due process. And that's what people are arguing a lot of times is saying you're not giving people due process in, in establishing a red flag law. You're just basically saying anybody can say, I can say he's crazy and now we're going to go take his guns. <laughs> and that is not, I, I think that is a violation. You know, there's no due process there. I think it's a constitutional violation of the second and the fifth amendment. But what if you've got an emergency situation? Look at that. The, the guy with the, what's her, what you have Gabby with, Gifford, the guy that shot Gabby Gifford. Here's, a, here's what most people want to do. And here's the, here's the problem with America. We always want to blame an inanimate object. We want to find something to blame. Mm-hmm. And, and, and guns are an inanimate object. I could set my gun on this table right now. And if nobody touches that gun for 100 years, it will rust. It will never harm a soul. But if somebody with mental health p- issues picks it up, if somebody with criminal intentions picks it up, if somebody with little to no care of, of human life, or if somebody with good intentions who actually has the ability to protect something, either way, that gun will never harm a soul until, unless somebody is actually in, in, with it. And so I really struggle with Americans consistent blaming um, I get that accessibility has an issue you know and, and people want to tell you that you can just go buy a gun you can't you have to go through a process you fill out paperwork and there is a, a process to getting a gun and there are processes in place orders of protection judges orders you know things like that um, 
I am not for red flag laws in any way, shape, or form. I have yet to see one that I think does not take away somebody's constitutional right. And I really think what we're failing to do is address the issues with our society in America, the deterioration of the family and all these things, uh, because we're coddling people's mental health issues nowadays, as opposed to actually... And so what we do is immediately blame guns and inanimate object. And I I just... I find it... Honestly, I find it... um, we're trying to excuse away our own behavior by blaming something that can really harm nobody without somebody behind the trigger. You see, I don't, I don't blame the gun. I blame the people around the people who was a little nuts who didn't call in and say, "Hey, he has a weapon or two or three or four or five or, uh, you know." But here's and one more thing, and I know, I know you want to ch- weigh in on this. It, it, anybody that with, that has bad intentions or mental health. They're going to get with criminals. It's illegal for criminals or prohibited possessors. It's illegal to own a gun with a shaved serial number, but criminals do it. Why? Because they don't follow the law. So when you pass things that are against the Second Amendment, guess who it affects? It affects law-abiding citizens. The criminals do it anyway. They break the law anyway. They're not following it anyway. How? Can what? Uh, can uh, I jump uh, in? Uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go, Go ahead, Mike. Mark. No, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm so glad, Sheriff Lamb's here because we can actually have a good conversation about this, even though we come at different angles, different positions. And so, one thing I want, I'll get to the inanimate object in a sec, but I do think that I think we agree with this. You have to buy a weapon legally, and so one of the issues that we have in the state and other states is you buy things on the secondhand market. You go to the county fair, pop a trunk open, and buy, buy a gun without any kind of background check. I think that's a big problem. I think the state has authority to come in there and regulate that kind of transaction. Let me talk about the inanimate object for one sec. Is We regulate people who can drive a vehicle. A vehicle can be on the road and can be a dangerous weapon and kill. We have hom- vehicular homicides happen every single day in the state, in this country. And we regulate the people who can get behind that wheel because they can't drive a vehicle. They either physically or mentally cannot drive that vehicle. Same thing with a gun. A gun is not just like a normal weapon. This is a weapon that can fire from a distance and can be lethal. It can be a semi-automatic weapon and can cause significant damage to people and persons, multiple people, very quickly. And so you have to have some ability to say to someone, you are not mentally capable of having this weapon. I'm not talking about an IQ issue here. I'm talking about mental health instability. We're talking about you know court-authorized taking away of a weapon. So there's due process involved with red flag law. So if someone says to, if I say to Mark Lamb, I've heard you talk here. I'm going to take your weapon from you. Well, there's going to be a due process before that actually happens. The court's going to have to determine whether or not that there is probable cause to say Mark cannot have a weapon for X and Y reasons. So there is probable, there is, there is due process. Anyway, so I just want to make sure I address those things. But I do think we come at this different. I think we have, there's ample ground for us to have a, a good discussion yeah. on it. I don't, for me as a prosecutor and for me running for county attorney, I have a problem with people buying weapons on the secondhand market. I have, pro, I have people... Gun ha- shows. Gun shows. Well, if, if you do it legally, I'm totally fine with gun shows. But if you, if you go in the parking lot, pop a trunk open, and you're in the business of selling those vehicles, and you're, I mean guns over and over again. I'm not talking about the one-off. If Mark wants to sell me his handgun from his collection, I'm not talking about that. So just to make sure, I want to make sure I make sure that perfectly clear. If you're in the business of selling secondhand guns and you're not doing the regulation to check on my status, that's a problem for me. I also have a problem with prohibited possessors. And so, and also as a prosecutor, these cases, the reason we have these laws is I know it impacts criminals, and we're not trying to go after the innocent folk. We're trying to have statutes so when I have a case, I can indict that individual for breaking this specific law. And that's why we have that law. I can charge that individual with breaking that law, and I hold him in custody and sentence him. And and, and I want to add on to what Mike was saying is, like, vehicles, okay? Yeah, we do have parameters, you got to be at least 16 years old. And frankly, there is no recurring thing that says, I can't call on my neighbor and say my neighbor can't drive and they come take his license. It's just not what happens. But what we don't do is we don't blame the cars. There's no effort to remove cars off the road. Yeah, We blame drivers. But when it comes to guns, we blame guns, not not the person behind the trigger. And the majority of Americans in this country who own firearms, hundreds of millions of, of firearms in this country, 
They are law-abiding citizens. They don't hurt people. Unfortunately, there are people that do, and 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 frankly, there's people that drive drunk and there's drive and we. The, the, there's more um, of those. America actually. is a place <laughs> yeah. where freedom. When you have freedom, you have the ability to to succeed to the moon, mm-hmm. and you also have the ability to drive yourself into the ground. And unfortunately, in a society, fortunately and unfortunately, when you have freedom, it comes with certain level of risks. And there are going to be bad instances. But what the government's current trajectory is, is to try to regulate everything. And if you do that, you're going to impede on freedom. And what we have to do as a society, I think, the answer is not about you cannot legislate your way out of a problem. We've learned that. We have tons of laws. We're getting worse. The crime's getting worse. Yeah. So you can't tell me that you can legislate your way out of a problem. The way you do it is you re- restore American values. You get back to believing in, in God. You get back to believing in the family unit. You get back to um, treating people. And if there are mental health issues, you address those mental health issues as opposed to catering to those mental health issues. I think that's the answer to our problems because if you try to answer it by legislating out of it, you're going to impede people's First Amendment right and that's not what America's about. That's true that.